All right, there we go. Um, okay, so this is 11. I don't know what happened there. This is module 11, Kashru. Uh, sure. And what is Kashru? Okay, basically eat this, not that. And the purpose of Kashru is to refine our humanity. That's from Genesis Rabbah. One of the things you find in Judaism is that, you know, you've got Torah and you've got uh, the prophets, Nevi'im, and you've got Ketuvim, which is uh, the writings, you know, the prophets and the writings and stuff. And then you have, um, then you have like um, commentary on that. That's the whole Holy Scriptures. And then you have commentary on that. And the big commentary is the Talmud, which is um, uh, just kind of a discussion on the laws that we have. And then you've got all these other books like Genesis Rabbah. These are, you know, uh, the sages sat down and they read commentary like very much like you would see when you go through a Chumash, you know, with commentary. So, OK, so what is Kashrut? So God basically says that, you know, in terms of eating animals, OK, this is what you can eat and this is what you can eat. Now, according to the Torah, man, humankind, I'm going to use that term, humankind was not always meat eaters. Okay, is that kind of ringing a bell with folks? Yes. Okay, what bell does it ring? Um, I know that from my upbringing, uh, and I know this in, in Spanish, I'm not sure if it's the same way in English, but it... Um, it used to rain mana. I don't know if that's the right word in, in English mana, as well. Yeah. Right. Mana. And um, I guess uh, the people were still hungry. So then God kind of, um, he he cut, they, they called it to me when I was a kid, it's like cutting a deal. Okay. You can eat this meat, but not that meat. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much how kosher is just kosher, correct? Well, you're you're kind of right on some of it, okay? And you're right. The, the, the Israelites were out in the wilderness, and you know what are we having for breakfast? Mana. Oh, okay. What are we having for lunch? Mana. Mana. <laughs> what are we having for dinner? Mana again? You know, come on. Can we have some meat? But it wasn't actually. Um, it was really Noah. When Noah came, uh, you know, landed with his ark. Before that, man, humankind were vegetarians. And God said, okay, now you can eat meat. And that's really what it was. You know, there were certain criteria. Like if you're going to slaughter an animal, you just have to slaughter the animal. That's it. Okay. You can't. All right. No suffering for the animal, right? Yeah. But what they used to do is cut limbs off of animals too and eat those. Because they didn't have refrigeration and other things. And it was barbaric. And God said, no, we're not going to do that. It wasn't until later that uh, Moses led uh, the Israelites out of Egypt and we were wandering through the wilderness and we stopped and we got the commandments and we basically developed this thing we now call Judaism that we started getting laws on how to behave. And part of it was, you know, you're going to be an example to people. And one of that part of that examples is that there's only certain things you're going to eat. Now, everybody else, you know, do you, you can do what you want, right? But because we're a holy people, they set aside specific animals to eat. Now, what makes one animal kosher and not? Now, there are specific criteria, but what is the reason for the criteria? And the answer is, we don't know and it doesn't matter. There are two sets of laws in Judaism, the mishpatim, which are judgments, and the chukim, which are decrees. The chukim, the decrees, it's basically because I said so. The mishpatim makes sense, like don't steal, right? Why shouldn't we steal? Because it's not your stuff. Very simple, right? But the laws of kosher, kosher really kind of have to do with the fact that God said it, and we trust God because everything else God said for us and did for us basically worked out. So God's proven that God is on our side, so we're going to go with it. So let's take a look at, let's delve into this. Jews and food. 
We sit down to eat multiple times a day. Kashru teaches us that each time we do so can be an opportunity to refer to affirm our deepest values. In this class, we'll focus on eating mindfully and making each bite sacred. And by the way, that's what we do in Judaism. We make everything sacred. That's why we say prayer. There are prayers for almost everything. One of the things that's, that, that I've gotten questions on is the eclipse. Okay. How does Judaism see the eclipse? Well, um, in the Middle Ages, Judaism kind of dabbled a little bit with, with superstition and stuff. Uh, and some people felt it was a, 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 an eclipse was a bad omen. But the bottom line is that it is an act of nature. And like other acts of nature, like lightning and thunder and rainbows, there are blessings that we say when we witness that. And there was a discussion as to which blessing. And there's one that, that affirms nature, like thunder and lightning, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so what are some food choices you currently make that reflect your identity? Religion, culture, geographic origins, health, family, traditions, and ethics. What do you say? Now, we have... Um, in our synagogue, we have a lot of people of, of uh, Spanish origin. So we get Spanish foods, right? Now, what about, and, and so what are some of your foods there? And it's really interesting because I look at all the people that are on this. We got a whole variety of cultures here, don't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, so what are, what are some, of your, uh, some of your backgrounds, some of your cultures? What are some of the foods that uh, you used to? She's on everything. <laughs> you, you know what? That, that's that's me. That, that's me as well. She's on everything. But um, I think for us, the, the, the biggest thing, like, for example, in Mexican culture is rice and beans and some type of meat, red meat or anything like that on the same plate. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, Spicy. You know, we don't do dairy and um, meat together. So in Judaism, if you're going to have a cheeseburger, make sure it's a veggie burger, like a bean burger. Yeah. Okay. What about, uh, what else? Tacos, quesadillas. <laughs> oh, you're, making me, you're making me hungry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I've always, I've always known quesadillas, especially, you know, like quesadillas are not kosher at all because... It's cheese and meat for the most part, you know. Well, what? Can well, you, it, it depends you how you make it. I mean, you can make them without meat. You yeah, know? With meat. yeah. Because then the other way is more kind of like a, a bidia. What is it? Birdia, bidia, quesadilla. Actually, yeah, my mom makes kosher birria. There you go. <laughs> and yeah. addicted to dairy. Go ahead, Adrena. Because I put sour cream or cheese on everything because that's how I grew up with my Mexican family is cheese and sour cream and and just it adds flavor and makes things moist and I don't know. <laughs> that's going to be hard for me. It's like no it's, sour cream. <laughs> then you would be happy to hear that one of the key foods in Judaism are called blintz. It's like, a, like a, um, a crepe, not necessarily like a taco, but like a soft crepe with a filling and sour cream and apple sauce on top of that. I love that. That sounds good. I think it's been easy. It's easy, been easier for me to eat, be eating kosher because after seven years of vegetarianism, plus a lot of the times uh, at the um, just seeing some of the meals that were uh, served there at the Buddhist temple, which were a lot uh, vegetarian and whatnot, you mm -hmm. you know, or, and some even vegan. Yeah. Um, that you can, yeah, I mean, you could eat pizza. You're just yeah. not eating the pepperoni on the pizza. There's yeah. all kinds of veggies you could throw on a pizza. Uh, you're going to eat, uh, eat a, a, like, a Mexican taco as opposed to American tacos. It could be chicken or beef with the cilantro and the onion as opposed to the Americanized version that has cheese on there. You know what I mean? So if you, again, if you're eating, there's ways to eat it and still enjoy it. You know, if you're going to have dairy, it could be later, you know. Right. The, 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 sorry. Vegetarian. <laughs> burritos, bean, cheese, yeah. and rice burritos are amazing. You yeah. know what I mean? Potato okay. Yeah. To <laughs> me, the, the hard thing is that one thing is saying what's kosher, but, you know, the, the way, like, I, I was, like, kind of growing up through, like, 
my father having orthodox parents is uh i don't know if it's the same thing um here in the conservative temple but one thing is saying what's kosher but then making sure it's cooked kosher right know? so that's that, that's what makes it very hard to go out to the street and eat such foods because you know like i've always known like okay well yeah you can't put cheese on on the you know like meat on on the cheese like for a pizza um, but we don't know if they use the same knife they cut the meat with to, you know, to cut the veggies, for example. And that's, especially in the Inland Empire, I think that's like the most challenging part when we go out to eat with the family. Well, we'll get into the particulars in a little bit, but Nicole, what about you? What about your culture and your, your types of foods? Nicole, you there? No? Oh, okay. I, I could touch on that a little bit because again I was raised uh, around a lot of a lot a lot of Asian friends and the Chinese I culture. Make, I used to make real Chinese food, but go ahead and I'll tell you what I used to do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and I'm not talking anything like Panda Express or anything like that. I mean, real stuff, you <laughs> yeah. know. Um, and it depends on the region. Uh, it depends on the region of China because there's a big, you know, they would use those on the coast, of course, more fish than meat. Um. And then certain regions uh, had cows and then pigs and whatnot, so they would mix it all up. But at the same time, a lot of the, even the the um, the Buddhist and Taoist uh, monks and whatnot, they were eating a lot of vegetarian meals. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of tofu, um, yeah. and then yeah, and then oh, there's oh, different style. The Shanghai style it's in Cantonese is different from Malin. Well, it. Tofu is amazing when it's made by the right people. And I will say this, throwing it out there in all honesty, the only people that really know how to make tofu well are the Asian community. Right. What I because used to, they've been doing it forever, you know? Yeah. I I used to, you know, I was vegetarian too, and I used to love working in a wok. Um, you just pour some like uh, oil, some sesame oil on it and fry up some tofu, some rice, some veggies and stuff, maybe make some tempura, you know, and it was great. So, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. So, and of course, you'll know that there's this big joke about Jews and uh, Chinese food, right? Oh, oh definitely. <laughs> okay. For over 3,000 years, Judaism has taught us that how we eat and what we feed ourselves are sacred and communal matters, sanctifying us, educating us, nourishing our identity, fortifying our mortality, our morality. We need that sustenance no less than our ancestors did. Our meals can feed our spirit too through the same simple guidelines that have shaped Jewish eating and Jewish living since the beginning of our people. Okay, so, Kashrut in Genesis, Navila, don't eat anything that died a natural death. This is really more Exodus. I don't know why that's Genesis. Okay, Treif, Trefa, don't eat part of something that is still alive. Blood, don't consume the blood because the blood is life. The Gid Hanas, Hanasheh, the sciatic nerve because of Jacob. And you all know that story of Jacob? He wrestled with an angel, or allegedly an angel. It never really says specifically. Yeah. And the man that he with whom he was wrestling grabbed him by the leg, the sciatic nerve, and you know, kind of pinned him. And you know, then then and basically Jacob walked with sort of a lip after that. So in honor of that, we don't eat the um that part of the um of the uh, animal. Okay. So why keep kosher? Study and rate the four rationales on a scale of one to four, based on which you find most compelling. Compare and discuss your ratings. Okay, so the first one. And by the way, you can all see this, okay? Yes. Okay. Reverence for life. The permission to eat meat is to be seen as a compromise, a divine concession to human weakness and human need. I've, 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 heard, I've heard this rationale before. The Torah, as it were, says, I would prefer that you abstain from eating meat altogether. For to eat meat, the eat meat, the life of an animal must be taken. And that is a fearful act. But since you are imperfect and since your desires cannot be stopped, you must at least be controlled. You may eat meat, but with a restriction, you have to have reverence for the life that you take. Um, I I think that's a derivation. I've never really seen that myself, but okay. <clears throat> Jewish distinctiveness. And this, see, I kind of like this. 
Kashrut has served as a means of Jewish identification and distinctiveness. Think that a lot of the things that we do are specifically to remind us of how we need to behave. They're like commandments, like the tzitzit, they're a reminder. The mezuzah is a reminder. B saying a blessing on, on almost everything we do is a reminder. So too, because eating is such a big part of our life, it's a reminder. In that way, Kashrut has contributed to the perpetuation of the Jewish people and the retention of its way of life. The urgency for strengthening whatever factors in Jewish life make for survival are even greater now than in the past. The observance of Kashrut commends itself as a means to the end, precisely because it can be practiced by any Jew. It is particularly effective in lending a Jewish atmosphere to the home, which in the diaspora is our last ditch defense against the inroads of assimilation. <clears throat> Mindful consumption. The biblical call to holiness is reflected by Judaism's attempt to elevate the satisfaction of all basic urges for food, drink, sex, in which we differ, not from any beast, unto a, wor a level worthy of humankind. Kashrut is a good example of how Judaism raises even the most mundane acts, the most routine activities, into a religious experience. <clears throat> what narrow minds look upon as a picayune concern with trifling kitchen matters is really an example of how Judaism elevates the mere physical satisfaction of one's appetite into a spiritual act by its emphasis on the ever-present God and our duty to serve God at all times. I, I kind of like that because a lot of Judaism, the idea is, okay, God created us with, with, with urges, all right? So rather than completely ignore those urges, there are acceptable ways to express those urges. And what they're saying is, you know, we all get hungry, we want to eat. So this is a way to eat and not, you know, devolve into barbarism. Like, for example, over here, blood. Don't consume the blood because the blood is life. That's respect for the animal. <clears throat> Physical health. This is my modernities. To eat any of the various kinds of food that the Torah prohibits us for us is unwholesome. The major reason why the Torah abhors pork, for example, is because it is very dirty and feeds on dirty things. You ever seen a chicken? <laughs> this is as the rabbis teach, the mouth of a swine is like walking excrement. <laughs> That's from the tractate, Barucho, 25a. So what makes an animal kosher? And this is cool because we just had um, our tractate that went all through it. So from the Torah, these are the kinds of animals you may eat. And first, before it goes, uh, this is Deuteronomy, so it also is in Leviticus. But what it first says is that there are three conditions. The animal must have a cloven hoof. That hoof must be cloven all the way through. And the animal must eat its cut. Okay, so here we go. These are the land animals you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. You may eat any animal that has a split hoof and choose its cut. All right, and see, so we see here, here's your cow, and here's a fish. However, of those that chew the cud or that have a split hoof, you may not eat. The camel, the rabbit, and the hyrax. Although they chew the cud, they do not have a split hoof. They are impure to you. Tamelach. The pig is also impure. Although it has a split hoof, it does not chew its cud. You are not to eat their meat or touch their carcasses. Of all the creatures living in the water, you may eat any that has fins and scales. See, fins, whoops, fin and scale. And here, cow masticate, ru uh, ruminates, uh, chews its cud and has a cloven hoof. <clears throat> But anything that does not have fins and scales, you may not eat for you. It is impure. The birds really don't have a criteria, but it lists them. And from listing them, the rabbis have discerned a what they think is a criteria. You may eat any pure bird, but this, but these you may not eat. The eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, the black kite, any kind of falcon, any kind of raven. The horned owl, screech owl, seagull, 
any kind of hawk, the little owl, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, and the osprey. The cormorant, stork, any kind of heron, hoopo, and the bat. Uh, did I see ostrich in there? Yeah. All flying insects are impure to you. Do not eat them, but any winged creature that is clean you may eat. The rabbis have looked at that and said, well, it seems that the birds were not allowed, that were not allowed are birds of prey. Any other bird is okay, like pigeons, turtle doves, chickens, turkey, things like that. <laughs> All flying insects are impure to you. Do not eat them, but any winged creature that is clean you may eat. Leviticus goes into that in a little bit more detail. It basically says that when you have an insect that has its legs higher than its body, that hops around, you can eat like grasshoppers and locusts. Do not eat anything you already find dead. The vila, you may give it to a foreigner residing in any of your towns and they may eat it. You may sell it to a foreigner, but you are people holy to God. Do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. So these are these are um, Yiddish terms, fleshik, from flesh, right? Fleshik, food that is made from meat, mammal or poultry. And we'll talk about poultry in a minute. Milkshik, milk, right? Food that contained dairy ingredients. My son was asking me about ghee. You know, since it's clarified, can is it is it able to be eaten? No, it's still it's still dairy. It's still butter, even though it's clarified. Harif, a food that is neither meat or dairy, like nuts, grain, eggs, believe it or not. Okay, do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. To which one rabbi in the Talmud said, well, I can't cook, but can I seethe it? Can I boil it? Can I fry it? No, dude. <laughs> this is a general admonition. Now, Rabban Gamliel, who was one of the Tanaim of the Talmud, one of the rabbis that helped develop the Torah, allowed his disciples, his students, to eat fowl and dairy. Why? Because he took this phrase literally. Do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. <clears throat> Since birds do not wean their young and therefore do not produce milk, then as far as he was concerned, if you want to eat dairy and chicken, like have a chicken salad sandwich with cheese on it, you are good to go. And it was codified later on. <clears throat> so again, be kosher, a mammal must have, again, chew its cud, cloven hoofs, a fish, fins and scales. How can you tell if a bird is potentially kosher? No. Good question. Separating meat and dairy. And this is from Exodus 23.19 and 34.26. And Deuteronomy 14, 21, this is in three places in the Torah. <clears throat> so Philo of Alexander, a person who boils the flesh of lambs or kids in their mother's milk shows himself cruel and brutal of character without compassion. And some people suggest that this is something that, <laughs> that uh, pagans did. Um, this is, well, Adriana, this is really your, your choice. Um, I'm not really a stickler for that myself. My feeling is that it's kind of on the border. You do what you feel is best. Uh, if you want to have a chicken quesadilla or a chicken and cheese enchilada, and you want to take that literally, that's really kind of your choice. Um, again, to me, it's a gray area. The rabbis have said, no, fowl is meat. And that was because it looks enough like meat to be meat. I would also suggest that when the children of Israel, you know, complained to Moses and said, we don't have meat, what did God send them? Quail, right? Which are birds, which are kosher. So there it is. All right. So moving right along. Uh, Maimonides, as for the prohibition of eating milk, meat boiled in milk, it is my opinion, not improbable, that idolatry is, there you go, something to do with it. Perhaps such food was eaten at one of the pagan ceremonies. <clears throat> Professor Jacob, Mil Jacob Milgram, the common denominator in these prohibitions is the fusion and confusion of life and death. The mother's milk, <clears throat> the life-sustaining food, should never become associated with death. So, which of these opinions make sense to you? 
Do you have your own theory about meat and dairy? Any oh, thoughts on that? No, it's it makes sense. I mean, if you if you're reading these, okay. Anything else? Is this regarding the theory on the separation of meat and dairy? Yeah, it's about these three comments. You know, this guy Philo of Alexandria, a person who boils flesh uh, of lambs and milk, and shows himself cruel. Uh, my modernies, you know, idolatry, pagan ceremonies, Professor Milgram, it's the confusion and fusion of life and death. So in terms of separating meat and milk, which one of these philosophies makes the most sense to you? Because these are basically, this runs the gamut of the opinions on eating milk and meat. So the first one? The first one. Okay. Because uh, I, I heard about that when I was a kid. Okay. My father, my father already told me that. So it's kind of makes sense to me. Okay. And um and so we we can like we don't eat hamburger. Okay. Cheese hamburger. <laughs> cheeseburger. So, cheeseburger, yeah. Yeah, I usually order a veggie burger and put cheese on it that way. All right, anybody else? <clears throat> okay. Um, so again, Fleischig, Basari, food, basar, basar. So that's the Hebrew word, basar, which means flesh. Um, a lot of times if you're like looking at a, um, oh, no problem. Um, just looking at a movie, sometimes you'll see the, the Hebrew, kosher, basar. Kosher meat. Made from either mammal or poultry. They have the or here, which the Jewish, Jewish dietary laws teach should be kept separate from foods containing dairy. Uh, milkshake, chalavi. Chalav is milk. Foods containing dairy ingredients, with the, which the Jewish dietary laws teach should be kept separate. And parif, neither. Now, the traditional waiting period between dairy and meat and the traditional waiting period between eating milk and dairy is, in order to keep from mixing meat and dairy, it's traditional to separate. All right. So what do you think the time is waiting between? Eight hours. Eight hours. Why do you say eight hours? I don't want to read it, but I've heard some people talking about that it was it was eight hours. Okay. It was basically uh, enough time for your your body to digest what was in your stomach. Okay, so that way it would dairy, be dairy and meat or both. Wait, is it is it the uh, orthodox by uh, eating? Is so when you finish your cheese, you could just like drink a drink a cup of water and then you could eat the meat immediately. Yes, that's that's one opinion. That's okay. one opinion. You so so eat... the 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 waiting period is just like no period right is it like okay like a minute some yeah the the standard is that if you can eat meat after milk as long as you know you have you wash you know have some water rinse your mouth out and you're good to go eating dairy after meat is the big deal okay so um nicholas i've never heard eight hours what i've heard is one hour from the dutch Three mm -hmm. hours Sephardic, six hours Ashkenazi. If you're a medical person, typically they will tell you that it typically takes, like you said, about three hours to digest food. So one hour, three hours, six hours, you choose the time that you feel is most appropriate for you. But there's nothing anywhere that gives you that time. It just says, don't eat it with it. Well, now what? Well, when it's in your stomach, you know, it's being digested. Meat takes longer to digest than dairy. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's probably a part of it. That's probably a part of the decision. <clears throat> and by the way, uh, the Hebrew diet is not really much of a meat diet. If you look in the Torah, when are you allowed, when does it say to eat meat? Either in festivals like Passover, when you do the lamb sacrifice, the, the, the Paschal lamb, 
um, when you're going to the temple and you're doing an offering or something like that. Most of the, the most of the diet was like, you know, beans and rice, beans and grain and some, you know, some milk. That was basically the diet. Bread was big. <clears throat> so dishes and koshering. In order to keep from mixing meat and dairy, it is traditional to separate cooking and serving dishes. How you kosher dishes depends on the material made from. So metal and glass, okay? Metal, basically you can scrub it. Glass, you can put it in a dishwasher. Ceramic is a little more challenging because again, you would put it in a dishwasher and as long as you heat it, the old school was to put it in the ground. But a lot of people feel that with the dishwashing, um, that's a high enough temperature to take care of. Okay, any other questions on that? No. Okay. Looking for hexures. Hexures. So a hexure is a symbol on a package that tells you whether it's kosher or not. And the symbol, these are basically organizations that are there that do this, that go out like, like OU, this o, this o and the U, and this O and the U, that's the Orthodox Union. They have a long history of going out and um, looking over foods, making sure that there's a, 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 a valid separation of the process. Um, a lot of times you'll see a food with a, just a K on it. And some people say, well, that's not really kosher. What some plants will do is they'll find a rabbi a local rabbi rather than pay all the money for one of these organizations to come out and, you know, look it over, you know, they'll say, Hey, do you know how to decide determine cost route? And they'll say, yeah. And then they'll say, okay. Um, you know, come and look at our, come and look at our process and make sure it's kosher. And these rabbis have some, you know, ability, they have some uh, knowledge and they'll do it. And then the little kid will put a K on it showing that they looked at it. You talk to the company, they should have a record of who the rabbi was. I had a situation where they didn't get back to me, even though they had the K. And I said, no, I'm not going to allow my congregation to have this food because you never got back to me. And I want to know that the rabbi that, that determined this was kosher, that they're valid. <clears throat> The hexures will off also often also indicate if the food is milkshake, flagshake, or pari. So a lot of times you'll see one of these symbols, you'll see like a D next to it, which means it's kosher, but it's only for dairy. Then you'll see a little P that's pari. You may see something that says that it's kosher with Pesach, kosher only for Passover, which is a little bit more of a kosher. So that's part of it. Foods that do not require a hexure that are just accepted as whatever, okay? Vegetables, fresh fish, milk, juice, coffee, of course, <laughs> eggs, sugar, flour, and spices. Typically do not need hexures. You're not, they're not, all right. Additionally, some observant Jews will eat other foods without a printed hexure but we'll carefully read labels to ensure the food contains no non-kosher ingredients. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kosher out there now. So, I mean, there's a lot of foods that have the kosher symbol on it. It's just becoming more and more, which is weird because you know, what, the, what the country's going through with, you know, Judaism, but Jews, so eh, whatever. Um, so, kosher meat. You may slaughter cattle or sheep as I have instructed you. Now, the funny thing is, is that we were never instructed how to, how, to, how to properly slaughter an animal. This is something that the rabbis figured out in the Talmud. So, 
the terms shechita, and it's that cha. Ch is cha in Hebrew. If you see a translated word, transliterated word with a ch in it, it's pronounced cha, like the German Bach. It's a guttural, like your um, like your gargle. The method of kosher slaughter involving an extremely sharp knife and a single cut to the animal's throat. The animal feels no pain, die instantly, blood is drained. A shochet is a kosher slaughterer, someone trained in the laws of shechita. This guy, <clears throat> Rabbi Gabriel Botnik. For almost a decade now, I have only eaten meat on Shabbat, Shabbat, holidays and special occasions. And when I do eat meat, I want it to be raised sustainably and locally to minimize my ecological footprint, slaughtered ethically to minimize animal cruelty, and certified kosher. Unfortunately, industrialized farming practices make it nearly impossible to meet that, those high standards. So I decided to take matters into my own hands by learning the holy trade of shkita, kosher slaughter. After an intensive year-long training process, I eventually became certified as a shochet, a slaughterer by the Israeli rabbinate. People often ask me if I consider shechita to be ethical and humane, and I honestly believe that it can be when done right. Shechita in its purest form can be an emotional act. It is one of the only forms of slaughter that actually requires a person to place their hands on the animal before taking its life. This means that in the proper setting, a shochet can look an animal in the eyes and express gratitude before offering a blessing and taking the life. How different that is from the mindless, brutal routine of, tip, of the typical slaughterhouse. The next question I am often asked is whether or not shechita is painless for the animal. Have you ever cut yourself with a kitchen knife and not realized until you look down? Well, a shochet's knife is far sharper and smoother than any knife in your kitchen. In fact, it could take a shochet up to six months just to learn how to sharpen and inspect the knife to the highest possible standards so that each cut can be as clean and painless as possible. Typically, it just takes a few seconds for the brain's blood supply to be cut off and for the animal not to feel pain. Shrita can be ethical and humane when done right. Unfortunately, many factors may prevent this from always being the case. When we insist on eating more than once or twice a week, we give rise to an industrial farming system. And industrial farming gives rise to industrial slaughter, which prevents shechita from being the profound and respectful experience it can be. So again, the Hebrew diet, the, um, <laughs> the meat is only eaten on special occasions like this guy does. That's actually, uh, I don't want to say a biblical mandate, but it's kind of the way it was done. I realize most people don't care to think about what happens to their meat prior to it being shrink wrapped into a styrofoam tray. But if we all commit ourselves to learning more about the meat we eat, eating less of it and insisting that it meets the highest standards, then we can actually help Shrita reach its potential for being the most ethical and humane form of slaughter. <clears throat> This is a um, Hebrew term. It means showing compassion to animals and preventing unnecessary slaughtering. What do you do to elevate the act of eating? This is again from the tractate Barachot, first tractate of the Talmud, uh, page 35, side A. Our rabbis taught it is forbidden to enjoy anything in this world without first saying a blessing. Anyone who derives benefit from the world without taking the time to offer a blessing is considered to have stolen sacred property. So our blessed, so. Here are some of the blessings for food. Now bread you see is, is comes right up at the top. Baruch ata Adonai Elohim melech ha'olam. Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Adonai. And here's the transliteration right here. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. All right, grains. And these are non-bread products. Baruch atadonai lehinamel ha'olam, barei mini mizonot. 
who creates varieties of food. So if you make a pie crust, is that bread? Do you, would you see a bread, bread blessing? Think about that for a minute. Wine and grape products. Baruch atad anayil hinamel chalam, borei peri hagafeng, who creates the fruit of the vine. Veggies. Baruch atad anayil hinamel chalam, borei peri ha'adama. So borei peri agafen, fruit of the vine, borei peri adama, fruit of the earth, and fruit that grows on trees, borei peri ha'ets, the rest who creates the fruit of the tree. And if you don't know what blessing to say, if it's something that doesn't fit into this, like protein, meat, eggs, dairy, water, that brings everything whose word, by whose word all came to be. So you're eating a pie, a fruit pie, an apple pie. Do you say the blessing for bread because it's crust? You're supposed to say what's more of that's on the 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 more of the ingredient the ingredient that there's more of well i've heard two opinions about that but the bottom line is i don't know i, I don't believe that a pie crust is really bread now pizza is different because you're making it like you make bread yeah you make you it with flour bread. Yeah, flour. Well, it's all, well, it's flour anyway. But you are using yeast. You know, you're rolling mm -hmm. it out. Yeah, I mean, when I it'll, make pizza, I mean, I make rises. Pizza. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're making like bread, a bread crust. But with a pie, you're really not. Now, I've heard exactly what you said. You know, if you're eating a pie crust, then there's really two blessings. There's one for the fruit and one for the crust, which would be the one here, <clears throat> grain, non-bread product. So, which would you say first? The more of would be the filling, which would be the fruit, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it would be beret priya eights, and then you would say the one beret me name is oh no. Some rabbis disagree with that, and they say the first blessing you say is for the food that you like the best. Other other what I, what else I've said is that if you're eating bread at a meal, that's the only blessing you need to say, and if you do eat bread, that would kick off the um that would set off the uh, alert that you would say the brachach amazon which is the blessing after the meal and that's only when you eat a bread meal so we say that saturday afternoon after we do our kiddush because we've had challah mm -hmm. so by the way what's the difference between challah and lechem lechem is bread what does challah mean <clears throat> anybody know When people would, back in the old days, would harvest their grain and they'd make bread and they'd make dough, they would take a part of that dough and that would be a donation, a tithe to the, to the Levites and the Kohanim. And that's the challah. The challah is the flower offering to the Kohanim and the Levites. That's the difference. What about, uh, is there a blessings for drinks? Um, if it's a fruit drink, you could say Bray Priya eights. If it's like soda or anything, you would use this one. Shehakal Niyeh Bidvaro. For anything that's not any of these. And the rabbis wanted to add blessings for like nuts and, you know, well, what about tomatoes and strawberries? They grow on a vine. Should we include them? Well, no, it's a different product. Maybe we should have a different, you know, and then they're at, well, you know, enough's enough, guys. You know, we don't <laughs> want to people here. Eating ethically. Okay, this is the Tsar Ba'ale Chaim. Prevention of unnecessarily causing pain to animals is a basic Jewish value. Among the traditions, warnings on the subject are <clears throat> Deuteronomy. You shall not plow with an ox and a mule harnessed together since both animals being of unequal size will suffer. The ox has to work harder and the mules being dragged. A person is forbidden to eat until they fed their animals. Because animals can't eat by them. Well, they can, but you know, if you have domesticated animals, you got to feed them. 
There is no difference between the pain of human beings and the pain of other living things. The love and tenderness of a mother for her young ones exist across species. That's Maimonides, Guide for the Perplexed. And that's why you do not take a, like a bird's chicks away from her, or eggs, until it's been eight days. <clears throat> eco root eco root is an attempt to renew the unity of Earth and humanity, according to Arthur Waska. eco root is an attempt to challenge the banality by which we consume and buy and bless and need. It is a call to stay away from trafe, traditionally torn by a wild beef, but it means anything that's not kosher. That which is dissonant with the preservation of the earth and we who dwell on the earth. It is a call to struggle with whether vegetarianism is the ideal form of eating, even though being a vegetarian does not absolve us of serious daily choices about what we buy and how much we consume. It is not only about labels and letters saying this food is kosher or not, but about making choices that reflect the unity in all creation, both bird and beast, woman and man. I used to, I had this book, this girlfriend back in college gave me this book called Diet for a Small Planet. And it was about combining non-meat foods, or I guess what they call plant-based food, based foods these days, to get a more efficient and more protein than by eating meat. So for example, you eat whole grains and cheese, that's a complete protein. Beans, nuts, and grain is a complete protein. <clears throat> I still do this when I eat. I, I, you know, if I don't eat meat, and I, I don't eat meat, you know, I, I don't avoid it, but I don't eat meat a lot. Um, I try to combine foods so that I get the protein. All right. Questions, comments, observations. Prepare a Jewish eating plan. That's probably a good idea. Take a look at your diet and say to yourself, okay, how do I, is this kosher? And if not, how do I make it kosher? So like the quesadillas, you know, I guess, like I said, if you want to put like chicken or turkey with the cheese, your call. But let's say you wanted to go full on kosher. Okay. How do you do a quesadilla, which is really mostly uh, cheese and a, um, and a taco. You could use beans, maybe do a little rice, right? Although you do have hey, <laughs> um so you can do that um chinese for example okay i'm thinking soy grain rice for example that's complete protein uh what else do we have oh trust great. me yeah, there, there's beautiful. there's some uh places that make um and chinese restaurants make amazing tofu with all kinds of different recipes that are really good you know Yep. So it's less meat. Oh, yeah. Like like you go into a Chinese restaurant, you order the, what is it, Buddha's Garden, they call it? Buddha's Delight. Buddha's Delight, yeah. And then There's, like those sprouts. Yeah. I used to make sprouts. I used to love making mung bean sprouts. Man, that, yeah, I mean, you've taken protein and just gone crazy with it on those mung bean sprouts. Mm -hmm. I should do that again. I forgot. How to, I used to love to cook and do stuff like that. Now that my wife's retired, well, she makes a lot of the food, so um what else what other ethnicities do we have uh italian okay again garbanzo beans kidney beans instead of your meat right i used to make spaghetti and garbanzo beans and cheese on it um stuff like that so there's a lot of things you can do vegetarian or avoid meat or just you know just just have the meat meat potatoes meat and whole grains and veggies you know, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And, you know, it seems really daunting at first, but as you get more into it, it gets easier and it becomes just a part of your lifestyle. It really but, does. Yeah. Especially if you've ever, you know, gone ahead and been vegetarian for a time. At first, you're like, oh, what am I going to do without meat? And then you just don't really, people say, well, what do you eat if you eat meat? Oh, everything else. Mm -hmm. um, one of the premises of the Diet for a Small Planet book is that, Look at all the non-meat food that goes into making a pound of meat. All the all the beans, you know, all the grain that the animals eat. You know, just eat it yourself. <laughs> and and I agree with you, Adriana. I I kind of like being a vegetarian too. I mean, yeah, we we don't really eat a lot of red meat. You know, we we have chicken and turkey, but not a really lot of red meat. Um, you know, it's just just our lifestyle. 
So, all right, any questions, comments? <clears throat> it's really tough sometimes abstaining from pig pork products. You know, you go and you have like these baby back ribs, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's it's harder where you already come from eating like that. You know, it's uh, cause I'll be honest, that's been my biggest challenge. Um, yep, that I I've been very like I eat everything and I I like everything I eat, and all of a sudden, you know, like I'm trying to change my diet around and like. I mean, right. I, you get used to it, but at first, like, it makes you, like, real um, uncomfortable, like, grouchy, you know? Yeah. But, 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 you at, know, the, you, at the same but, time, but it's, it's it. that sacrifice yeah. at first that you realize isn't a sacrifice at all. Exactly. It's more of a, uh, more of a connection, you know, and... What the word mitzvah means, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and it's one of those things where... I, I know I've found in my in the way I eat and stuff like that of of just the other day I was looking at some um products and it was supposed to be all beef and then I looked at the label and it said mixed with pork and it's like go oh, right. put that back you know and it's yep. like you end up you end up becoming more knowledgeable about a lot of different things and there's another thing that it does it makes you more disciplined if you look at Judaism very. Yep. it's a very disciplined religion and that's why we, we practice a lot of self-control and we direct our lusts and our urges. And that's why we've made it so long because we don't like give in to things. You know, we, we, we have, we're civilized people, you know, God wants us to be civilized. God wants us to be humane. And, you know, you gotta, um, I have this hanging up on my wall from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, who is mighty one who subdues their passions. Right. Yep. So that's, you know, I mean, that's kind of a tough one, too. Um, OK, so the idea issue of bread, it depends on whether you consider matzah bread. Matzah is considered bread and you would eat matzah using you would use the same blessing as for bread, a mozi lechem in arts. And that's what happens for the eight days during Passover. We don't eat any leavened products. Matzah is bread. It's flat bread. It is bread. It's just not risen. And if you were going to make your own matzah, you would, you would, first of all, no wheat, no yeast. You'd roll it out and immediately you'd stick it right in the oven so it has no time to rise. Now, yeah. So here's the condition. So how did they know about yeast three, 3,500 years ago when we started when God gave us the commandments, you know, don't eat any leaven products. Don't eat any chametz. That's what it's called, chametz. People didn't really know that much about yeast. They knew that, I mean, you're in the Middle East. Yeast is everywhere. You put out some dough. You start, you know, putting it together. And it starts rising because there's yeast everywhere. How did they figure out yogurt? Which, by the way, I don't think is, a, is an appropriate food for... Um, Passover, because even though there's no yeast, there's still the acidophilus. And what does it do? It goes in there and, you know, it makes the milk rise kind of. So I don't eat yogurt. That's just, but that's just me. So um, they didn't discover yeast till later on. They just knew that there was a substance that makes the bread rise. And then finally they started figuring out what is it? There's this yeast. So um, that's why you clean out the house to make sure there's nothing there that can get into the bread that might make it rise. Okay, any questions on that? <clears throat> Eat only kosher varieties of fish and refrain from eating shellfish. Shellfish is not really fish. Shrimp, clams, oysters, uh, crabs, crabs, I said crabs, uh, lobsters that everybody loves. I can't stand them myself, but um, those aren't fish. Those are like crustaceans and stuff. Can't eat them. I don't know why you'd want to. You ever see an oyster? Uh. Technically, they're the vultures of the sea. Oh, yeah, the bottom feeders, yeah. Eat only kosher meat and poultry at home? Okay. You know, sometimes people have a hard time going going to a restaurant. Um, you can be real discerning. You know, you could not eat meat. I do that a lot. You know, I go to a restaurant and um, I either speak with, with, with poultry or um, I just go veg veggie. Uh, pescatarian. That's vegetarian and fish. 
that's that's a good way to do it. I've done that. Oysters clean the ocean away. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Avoid eating dairy and meat together. <clears throat> like oil and water, there are some things that just don't mix. In order to observe the three times repeated commandment, not to boil a kid in its mother's milk, we refrain from having these two types of foods mixed together. Uh, purchase a Jewish cookbook with recipes. That's one way to do it. Acquire separate dishes for preparing and serving meat and dairy meals at home. There is nothing anywhere that says you have to do that, but that's what the rabbis called putting a fence around the Torah to make sure that your dishes don't contain any type of crumb of what you're not supposed to be eating together. Observe a waiting period between eating, eating meat and dairy, like I said, hour, two hours, three hours. Okay. Baking challah, lots of fun. And I think there's a recipe here in the Shabbat chapter. Uh, whatever. All right. So that's that. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I was going to say I'm allergic to shellfish earlier when you were um, pointing out that shellfish is in uh, kosher. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to interrupt you, but um, yeah, I'm allergic to it anyway, so I'm oh, all good. Go. So it works out for you then. Works out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that got you. You were born to be Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that and being an accountant, right? Yeah. <laughs> you go. All right. What other questions? All right then. Um, see you guys on uh, Friday, Saturday, and this Sunday is going to be the in-person Hebrew school. Um, and like whoever you got kids come, um, uh, while the kids are in there learning about Passover, I'll probably do an adult study. So, you know, we'll do something there. Um, yeah, we get you a, a recipe to make challah. But um, yeah, the kids, we want to get the kids in there, get them thinking, you know, get them getting excited about Passover. Uh, so other than that, you'll be just... Stay tuned. Will, will there be temple services um, like the first two days and the last two days of Passover? Or? Yes. Yes, there will be. I always okay. do. So, in fact, I was, it's funny you should mention that because today I was getting, um, I was making my spreadsheets for those uh, uh, services, which is really easy, actually, because I just used what I did last year with two exceptions. Number one is the Psalm of the Day. They're on different days. Number two uh, the seventh day of Passover last year was on Shabbat. So this year it's the same reading, but there's a inch, there's the first two aliot. The first, a second aliot is like practically a whole chapter. So it's going to be a shorter reading. But yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, the first days of Passover are Tuesday and Wednesday, and the seventh and eighth are Monday and Tuesday of the following week. So Shabbat is an intermediate. And by the way, the intermediate Shabbat of Passover, which is going to be the 27th, we're going to have a bat mitzvah. Oh, beautiful. The family that moved from um, from here to Texas, they're coming back specifically for the daughter's bat mitzvah. Oh, so it's amazing. So, I may be reaching out to you then, uh, Rabbi. I know that um, I already brought this up to Jacob and Emma's school. Mm -hmm. But if there's any way that the temple can give me like a letter confirming the days that they're for religious practice, um, that'll help. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Send me an email with the specific days and I'll turn it into a letter and I'll email it to you. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, right now, it's, it's all, what I got right now, though, is Google Docs. So um, <laughs> after Friday, Nicholas, right, maybe we'll have the yep. in, but we'll, have, we'll have it set up. <laughs> but I got to tell you, I'm using the Google Docs and everything and the PDF. And it's I got to tell you, it's working out just fine. I'm, I'm, you know. Yeah, it's it's working. It's working good. The only thing, like I said, that it would be different would be uh, PowerPoint and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and Excel, to be quite honest with you. That's that's the one thing I kind of well, I've got the Excel, but you can use sheets. Sheets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is. Yeah. You know, I mean. Sheets sometimes is a little picky. But uh, again, because I mean, there's so many macros you can write for Excel and stuff like that. And honestly, macros went out in 1998, but people still use them. Nah, I don't use them. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> but I, I like just, I like tech. You know? I really do. I mean, oh yeah, 
I'm a baby boomer and everything, but you know, we, we grew up with, I mean, we saw the big computers, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Univax with the, like on Star Trek, when they went back in time and there's those big, yep. you know, so vacuum tubes, vacuum computers tubes. back in the, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember transistor radio and you had the little, the little transistors. It was, you know, it's kind of cool. I miss those. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, my wife still got, uh, she has these records and I got her. Oh, okay. See you later, Eddie. Thank you. See ya. So um, she had all these records and we didn't have a record player. So for uh, our anniversary, I got her this like retro looking Victrola and that does mm -hmm. you know, CDs and cassettes. Oh yeah. Back in the day, it'd be big, but now I mean, playing records and it's really kind of cool. Good night, Adrena. Let me know if you need a note. Okay. I'll get you a note about religious practice, but we'll see you Friday. All right. So that's all I got. Anything else? That's it. Very good. All right, folks. Thank you. We'll see you next week when, um, oh gosh, what is it going to be? Next week, our lesson will be, oh, the Middle Ages. That's going to be fun. Rashi, Rambam. That's cool. All right. All right, folks. See you then. See you later. Bye.